Listen, listen. Label here. Um, hey y'all, it's Delaney. And it's Katie, and we're the host of Classically Black Podcast. So we talk about classical music and the with trap beats playing in the background that's our period listen <laughs> they tried it today they were like mm. and we can cut up regardless even more now because i guess the universe don't want us to say something <laughs> <laughs> okay so welcome everybody to classically black live um you know unfortunately we can't be you know in front of y'all right now but this is actually closer to what we actually do um but before we start um, I just want to remind everybody that there's a Q&A function in the top right of your screen. Um, if you want to ask us questions, you want to, you know, um, I don't know what you want to do. But if you want to use the Q&A thing, <laughs> it's right there. Uh, you can do so. Okay, so I'm going to give uh, people who don't know about our show a little background, you know, so we can all get on the sh- same page. Classic Black Podcast is a weekly podcast hosted by myself and Delaney Harris. We talk about classical music and being Black. And the profession of this show is blackity black, black, blackity black, black. Um, this is not your typical classical music program for that reason. Uh, we bring the black experience to the mics every week and speak about classical music in the way that we hear it. So you'll hear phrases like that slaps, this is lit, that goes dumb, she did that, all that stuff. Uh, we also incorporate a lot of black culture into our show. So in like referencing like the WAP episode we did when, we, when Cardi B and Meg Thee Stallion dropped WAP, we yeah, talked about that. Mm-hmm. You said what? <laughs> yeah, right. We always practicing. That's exactly what it means. We always practicing. Right. That's, yep. From my teacher. Yep. <laughs> um, and also this is, you can see this in our recent uh, episode we did on Jasmine Sullivan's new album. And we always tie it back around the classical music. So don't worry, it's not, we're not just talking. Um, and we also do a lot about, a lot of like telling it how it is, stuff that the classical music industry is not really ready to hear. Um, you know, this field is not comfortable with change and we say exactly what needs to happen to change. A lot of times we're speaking to the choir. So most of our listeners um, agree with what we're saying. So it's fine, I guess. Um, but if, if y'all really wanted to have some reform, listen to Classic Black Podcast. Um, our show is typically in multiple segments. Today, you'll only be hearing two of those segments. So if you wanted to get a, a better idea of like what Classically Black is, we got 117 of them joints right over there on Spotify, Apple Music, whatever you listen, Apple Podcasts, you hear me? Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, whatever you listen to your podcast on. Okay. All right, then. We usually just start with a little, you know, a little banter or whatever, because I don't know, it's weird. I know people are watching, but it's like, this is usually how we do. It's just me and Katie, but can we get into these aliens? Let me see, lean in. Let me see, listen. <laughs> ah, come on with the um. Uh, black woman owned, family owned. Get into it. So, <laughs> who are you feeling like? I got mine from Amazon. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I mean, okay. So, <laughs> before we get before we get into it, first, um, I just want to give a, a huge, a huge, huge shout out to Gary McQueen uh, for the session that he just did. Gary, gay, gay. Listen, we're talking about, um, we talk about a lot of issues in classical music. We talk about um, a lot of things that pertain to Black musicians, um, especially, um, and a part of that is us supporting each other and, um, and you know, being there for each other and backing each other up. So we just want to uh, name that for Garrett mm-hmm. and we also wanna, um, thank him for, for the shout out he did for a, an event that we're doing. Um, uh, black content creators on the ground. We're talking to independent Black musicians and content creators. Um, who want to collaborate and support each other for a common cause, much like what we do here on Classically Black, what Garrett does at Triloquy, um, and what so many other people, um, so many other people do. Uh, so if you want more information on that, it's isblackmusicians.com. That's our website where you can find our event, Zoom link, all of that. We're inviting all Black content creators and musicians to go to that. All Black. Right. And so now, the session. <laughs> okay, so we're not gonna ignore the elephant in the room. You know, America has been in shambles. America has I'm, been in shambles. I'm about to say, <laughs> I just feel people just notice. Yeah, yeah, but obviously there's been a, an, a a series of uprisings in the past year, and reason and and rightfully so. Um, and amidst all of this, a lot of institutions, not just orchestras, not just classical music institutions, not just conservatories, it's really everybody. Um, but that's what we're here to talk about. So they released statements saying, listen, we do not stand for racism. We don't do that. Not mm-hmm. over here. Not mm-hmm. us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
not us. Unfortunately, I don't know about you, but I felt as though seeing those statements, it was an insult to my intelligence. It was, it, especially like, I'm not gonna name names, but institutions that I have gone to, posting that you don't stand for racism, when one of few black composers was on my recital. And y'all, okay. The last time it was a black composer before my recital was your recital. But <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we not naming names, but I'm just saying. Right, but Interesting. Um, obviously, you know, these statements come out because people really truly believe that. Um, and they're trying to right a wrong. But the issue is we see a lot of misdiagnosing of the problem. So that's what this session is going to be. This session is going to be us taking one of the many, 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 many issues and unpacking it. We're taking the number one thing we always hear when they're saying, okay, we don't stand for racism and we're gonna, we're gonna incorporate black people into what we do. We're going to include black composers, black musicians. We're gonna do all of these things. And there's one question that we always hear is what about the quality? So we're going we're gonna to start by unpacking some of the blind spots that classical musician, uh, classical institutions face when they want to address the inequalities and systematic issues in our field. So let's talk about why uh, these institutions can't change. And I think the first one you already touched on is the fact that one thing that I really hate about this country and whatever trickles down from that is the fact that it always takes some type of calamity to to strike before it's like, oh, we gotta do something. Girl, what? I, I cannot believe that like literally some, some of y'all go to rehearsal and it's a sea of whiteness and that is completely normal to y'all. Like it is completely normal to be like, yep, ready for the A and it's just, that is not normal, but it, it takes uprising and it takes like pressure because let's not, because black people have been killed before. On camera. On camera. Me and will be killed after that. And, and, but it was the pressure of that to be like, oh, maybe we should do something. Like what, that, it should not take, and I, uh, Garrett touched on this in his session about like this idea of gradual change. Stuff don't have to be gradual change. That doesn't make any sense. Like, it doesn't, it shouldn't take like something catastrophic happening to be like, oh, we should do something about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, I think the, the, the point about it also being pressure is super, super important because a lot of people came out and were like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it took all of this. It took his murder, it took George Floyd's murder for all this to happen. And it's like, I remember being, I've been traumatized by so many black girls in high school and, you know, in, in middle school of, of just logging into your Facebook, 13 year old little you and saying a black person die, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I know I'm not the only person that saw it. Mm -hmm. And I know that these uh, statements were not being released then. I really think it's a shift in the culture that allows people or th that no longer allows people and no longer allows institutions to not explicitly name that. But the problem mm -hmm. with not, with the problem with explicitly naming that with no accountability is that it just looks like what it is, a lie. Mm -hmm. So um, I want to, get into this this issue of quality because um i feel like a lot of um musicians a lot of audience members that's that's one of the main thing that comes up when we talk about including black people into um into what classical music is doing right now so i want to start by uh talking a little bit about like what we even view as quality um what what does that even mean in classical music institutions? And I think one of the one of the issues that's really been in my face lately is the fact that so many people um, in this field see classical music as a foundation for music in general, mm -hmm. and also have a very narrow view of what classical music is. Mm -hmm. so they see Florence Price as the as uh, the blueprint. They don't see Adolphus Hellstork as the blueprint. They don't see Ulysses K as the blueprint. They see Mozart. They see Haydn. They see and which uh, we can pull over and hide it because I'm, I'm really confused. <laughs> nah, nah, one, four, five, six, five, one, and that's y'all blueprint. <laughs> okay, 
<laughs> um, okay. and they see that as the blueprint. And I think that um, there's obviously there, there's two levels to this because, like I said, they don't see all the black composers as the blueprint. Um, and that goes into who is excluded from classical music as it exists and as we understand it. Like mm -hmm. if we, we did a show called Put Me On where we talked to people who were not classical musicians and we asked them how, how many composers can you name? And the, all of these names that that we know, they know. They Everybody named Beethoven, everybody named Mozart. Some mm -hmm. people were named Bach. Like this idea of what classical music is even to people who are not in it, um, they know these names because they have been held up as the pinnacle of what mm -hmm. success in classical music looks like. Um, and then on the on the flip side of that, classical music as the foundation for music in general, and that bleeds out to other genres. And that goes into the um, the demonizing of some other genres um, mm -hmm. and the, the, you know, talking down to people who play other genres. I always use the, the um, comparison of rap music because a lot of people treat rap music as, as if it is the antithesis of classical music um, because they're like, oh my God, some of y'all favorite classical music content creators, we're not naming y'all names, but um, we'll, we'll say, well, we'll rap music is, you know, has no melody, has no harmony, whatever. And also besides the fact that neither of those things are true, um, I think- Literally untrue. The, the viewing of other genres of music and especially genres that are pioneered and championed by black people um, as the viewing of those through a classical music lens, classical music as we learned it in, in you know, conservatory because Katie and I are both conservatory trained and that is a doozy. Um, viewing it uh, through, the, the, through that lens um, is first of all detrimental to us because it limits the, the scope of how classical musicians can collaborate um, it also limits the musical offerings that classical music institutions um, offer because if you want to analyze, you know, something from another genre, you want to analyze rap music, you may be looking at, you're looking at lyrical content, you're looking at rhythm, you're looking at texture, you're looking at all kinds of other things that you're not learning in theory 101. I mean, it's, I feel like it's, and it's really interesting when that happens because classical musicians are trained to be like detail oriented people, right? So it's like when you listen to like one of my favorite rappers period is Takeoff because I think that I've, I've said this several times like I think Takeoff is like he is really like a he's rhythmically complex, you know, he's innovative, you know, I just I just I really enjoy his music and maybe it's because like I, I, I didn't grow up uh, listening to classical music. I don't know, but I listen to that and I'll be like, that's rhythm, rhythmically complex. But also, didn't I take the same training that y'all got? Can't you realize that when you listen to that? But you are listening to the to the, to the the baseline harmony. It's like, I don't understand why when you when you listen to a string quartet, now it's time to bring out your, your music theory training and be like, oh, and, the, and this happened and then that went up and that, and then it went like this. But when it, mm -hmm. But when it's like, when you listen to the baby, it's like, oh, this is so simplistic and it's this and that. And I'm like, where did, what happened to all the stuff that you were just talking about? It, it like, and it's like, you know, I'm not saying that that's the way in which you should analyze that kind of music because that's not, they're not the same, but it's like, you, you think that that type of, um, that type of like academic prowess is only reserved for classical music. And that's a problem. Yeah. Academia. Because this is a dizzy, and, and, and I want to reiterate that we're not just talking about orchestras and we're not just talking about chamber music collectives, we're talking about institutions because that, you know, institutions, period, and that includes institutions, educational institutions. And that also, I mean, they have a, a unique opportunity because they're catching uh, people, you know, before they go into the classical music world, before they're in the actual workforce of mm -hmm. classical music. And I'll tell you every time I get an email from, <clears throat> Uh, my my alma mater about girl when where's our money at I'll be like uh, where was my black composers at in music history <laughs> they love throw that comprehensive word around but that um that brings me to a point that I really want to drive home and and people who, who listen to classical like a lot are probably like we tired of hearing Dwayne talk about this but something about um about you know the things that we include in curriculum um in programming. Um, it just doesn't sit right with me because we love to, you know, to slap, you know, some composer on 
but we don't want to actually uproot the systems that mm-hmm. that keep the the canon in place. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is additive versus reformative. Mm-hmm. Two different things. Um, additive is yes, we're gonna play all nine Beethoven symphonies this season. We're gonna play all six Tchaikovsky symphonies, all forty-one Mozart symphonies, and <laughs> we're gonna add a concert and play Afro-American symphony. And we're gonna play Florence Price's symphony, her third symphony. We're gonna play X, Y, Z. On the same concert in February. Exactly. Now, reformative means recognizing that although you may love Beethoven, and listen, I'm not one to, you know, to do all that, but I do, I do enjoy Beethoven. I listen to, I listen to Beethoven, um, but I do, you need to understand that there are uh, systems in place that have put him where he is in the canon. And that doesn't mean he's a bad composer, but that does mean that it was unfair. Mm-hmm. It was unfair. And to reform that means that sometimes you're going to have to leave him. That doesn't mean make the concert 20 minutes longer. That means mm-hmm. leave him. And I guarantee you, if you skip Beethoven, if you skip Beethoven for a season, the girls will not forget about Beethoven. They celebrate his first birthday. They celebrate the first time he walked. They celebrate his first fish sandwich. They celebrate his first time in France. There is a Beethoven anniversary literally every three to five business days. I promise you, if you skip Beethoven for, for a season, like a full nine month season, we will not forget. We can't, we, we cannot, y'all won't let us. It will be okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, I, and, and to put that in context of what that looks like in, in curriculum in like a conservatory or, or something like that, um, I see like, I was in a meeting, we'll just say that, I was in a meeting and they were like, well, we can add this class about, um, we can add this class about Black composers, about Black music and whatever, and great, I would love to take a class about Black music. However, music students are already overburdened and Instead of looking back or taking a step back and looking at the entire picture, they said, we're going to keep everything we have, everything that has upheld white supremacy in this institution for the past 100 years. We're going to keep all that. We love it. And then we're going to put this one class on top of that instead of looking, okay, well, hold on. We've been around for a hundred class, years. You a whole class on just Waldo? One whole class. Listen, like you, you... First of all, and, and that's another that's another point. Also, you got to look at the the actual structure of like how you do these classes. There's a class you can do a class on Beethoven piano sonatas, and you have a class called BIPOC composers. <laughs> and that's like you. normal to you. Like that, how does that not? <laughs> it, it's nor, it's normal to a lot of people. A lot of people don't take that extra step. They want to say like, oh, we have added these people into the mix, and so in in some way, shape, or form. Um, but you've grouped together, first of all, you've grouped together a huge, a huge amount of people, Black, Indigenous, people of color, which means just a plethora of things. A plethora I'm going to keep, th- keep my opinion on that for the, for the text message. Mm-hmm. And, um, and you've added that on top of it, instead of looking back and first of all, seeing how has the curriculum or the programming as a whole upheld this, these white supremacist ideals in this institution, um, and, and how can we change that? And how can we, how can we mix that up, you know? Um, and then like Katie said, also looking at the structure of the, um, the classes themselves and saying, how do, you, how do you offer these things to your audience, to your students? Because a lot of, especially in a lot of classical music institutions that also include jazz, um, I'm not gonna speak for everywhere, but some of them, um, will require jazz students to take the classical curriculum up until a point, and then they can go off and do the jazz. Obviously, obviously, they're doing jazz performance, but the theory, the music history, needs to know all the classical stuff, and the classical musicians don't have to learn any of it. They don't have to learn nothing about jazz the entire time there. And that goes back to my point about seeing classical music as a foundation for other genres of music. And jazz was influenced, jazz was influenced by, by, by other genres of music, sure. Why don't you, they could be taking a gospel class. Mm-hmm. Swamp spirituals were, were huge, you know, in, in jazz. So I feel like um, to say that, I feel like that's just like a false 
you know, not to say that no one who ever played classical went on to play jazz and took some things over, but come on. Mm-hmm. Also, music has taken a, a ton of things from jazz. Mm-hmm. So, and I think, I think like as someone who went to a state school and then went to my, uh, my past school, I think I, what I, what I would say is I think that conservatories can take can learn a lot from state schools because when I when I did my undergrad at Illinois State University, it was a liberal arts education. So while my major was music education, I was required to take like all the stuff that the music the music performance people took plus the ed classes, and then I was in like chemistry and freaking financial literacy and um, math and biology, and like there were some. There was some crossover, but so like some of your music courses did count for some of your, whatever your liberal art, your 12 liberal art credits or whatever. But my point is that when I got to, when I got to grad school, I knew, I knew everything about Bach. I knew everything about Mozart. I knew everything what y'all knew coming in. I knew the same stuff that y'all knew. And it's like, my music history courses because of the nature of the curriculum at my state school and I feel like a lot of people who went to state school can speak to this I had two I had two music history courses I had like one little one I took okay three I've had one little one I took in sophomore year that was just like here's all of music history (laughs) that's what it was and then I had one where it was pre-1750 and post-1750 not y'all taking 1700 to 1720 that's one course so you like you know, it doesn't you see like that so when you try to add in like taking a course on gospel taking a course on black composers you know what i'm saying taking a course on um taking a course on american black composers like there is room for that y'all just don't want to let go of the fact that like you you have centered whiteness so much you don't even know how to depart from that and i feel like if y'all want to you have to, i guess you want to keep some of that stuff Take a lesson from the people who don't have the flexibility for that. I didn't, I couldn't do that in undergrad. I had to take, I took two. That, that was it. You know what I'm saying? So there is, there is wiggle room. Just say y'all don't want to do it. Mm-hmm. That part, because there's a, and there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of uh, different moving parts to who doesn't want to do it. Because, you know, mm. we can't ignore the, 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 the the fact that classical music institutions have a lot of stakeholders, they have the musicians, they have the donors, um, the audience members, which I don't know, that's really just seeing the, the the comments on some of the the statements and, and things audience members is really hard. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but also I feel like there are people like us, there are people um, like Garrett over at Truly, if y'all can't tell, we're a fan. We are fans. <laughs> but um, you know, who have who have taken in, you know into our minds that yes, we have uh, people who support us um, and who you know patronize our business, our businesses and our causes. But we're gonna speak our truth no matter what, and these are our values, and that's period. You know, and I feel like um, at a especially in classical music, a lot of people feel like they need to dance around that. Um, they need to dance around that um, to, to, I guess, cater to what these um, what these other stakeholders would like because they feel as though they cannot stay afloat um, without them. But, you know, I would argue that not changing at all is going to do exactly that. Yeah. Because... I just feel like, you know, th- these issues, especially when it comes to including Black people in um, these conversations and these spaces, they have become something that people see, um, people politicize. Um, and that really, that got to me because the other day I saw, you know, a comment and they were like, well, how do we, you know, as institutions toe the line of Black Lives Matter and, and taking a political stance? And I said, I just can't even... As a, as a black person, just seeing that someone really truly sees your life, your right to live as like, wow, I'm taking a political stance. What am I gonna do? It's just like, gee, I'm sorry, I didn't know me wanting to breathe was a <laughs> was a political statement. My bad. Yeah, and I, I really feel like it needs to not it needs to not be framed that way. And and 
and in these statements, you know, maybe that's something that classical music institutions address. Maybe mm-hmm. that's something that you really need to take a stance on is that, well, hold on, you have a misunderstanding of this. Mm-hmm. It's not, it's, it's not no, we, now we're on the campaign trail. Like, it's, yeah. it's <laughs> like, <laughs> but I think you touch on something like really important is that also it's not, I mean, yes, it's like the whole institution, but also I think the people inside of it, even the people who have to answer to the institutions, like the musicians who, who want to play, that is a task for them to play, um, to play black composers that's a task while we playing this y'all want to play you know i stand but y'all want to play tchaikovsky every year for the nutcracker y'all want to do that the musicians in the orchestra they want to do that there is um one person that we both know that they they program the same stuff and they cycle it they cycle it through every three years because like they don't want to learn new scores and did they say that no but like why else would you play uh, what was it? Uh, Dvorak eight, eight, twice in three years. You know what I'm saying? So it's like there are people who answer to the institution who also don't want it to change. And it's like, well, why don't we wait for these people? Like, oh, well, like you know, the new generation is coming up. That is like such a tired. That is such a tired hope. Don't that that's like oh, it's like a waste of time because the the there are those people right now are teaching the next generation, <laughs> just like the um the people y'all thought would die out are now in congress that doesn't make sense it doesn't work that way oh we just gonna wait for them to die out i'm like okay me you and jesus gonna be waiting (laughs) 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 oh chile you say right good intermission Mm -hmm. okay so this is a part of our show where um we take a break um i feel like it's gotten better over our episodes, because Delaney used to, uh, which probably do, still do, I don't know. She used to uh, dread the little intermission or whatever, because I might have put her through one or two things, like, wasn't even that deep. Um, but uh, today, I said I was gonna, we weren't going to give no free game um, in this uh, in this session, but I wanted I wanted Delaney and I, we were gonna we are going to program a community outreach concert. So I asked Delaney to pick three pieces um, and program a concert that you might do to for a community outreach concert. Um, and we're gonna play like little snippets. This is exactly how we do on the show if I, if I did a musical inspired intermission. We would play snippets um, of what those was. And we made a joke when we were playing this, like we better not see, we better not see none of this program. <laughs> <laughs> be, these pieces are off limits. <laughs> these pieces are off limits. Go find your own, do your own <laughs> research. Okay, you want to go first? Sure. So yeah, this is just a little, you know, like Katie said, a little break from, you know, the, you know, the back, of, the back of some people's necks probably got hot during the first half, but you know, we keeping it lighthearted. So I'm gonna take you on a journey through my mind. Uh, so for Don't my, you always been in the rules. It's about to be freaking. Been in the rules. I've not been in the rules. But um, I'm taking it through my mind because you know me. I like I like programming with purpose. I like a through line, a story, especially when a community engagement. The the point is to you know kind of feed off of that community aspect. So I'm thinking about my community and I'm thinking about um, some of the things that that I really enjoyed um, growing up. And one of those things was block parties. Okay, I'm following. Um, Sound cute already. Block parties slash cookouts. I because I think black. Black parties. Yep, that's what they are. But I mean, parties, <laughs> compass, uh, cookouts, but not the other way around. So th- that, that's the vibe. Um, and, and that's a really, I think, culturally significant uh, aspect um, of, you know, Black community. Um, and music is a really important and integral and, um, and unifying aspect of a Black party. A Black, you hear me? What's going Listen, on? the university the university you hear me the universe wants it so i'm just saying um it's a unifying aspect of a cookout or a block party um especially when it comes to making connections like cross-generational connections you know you got th- like at every block party you got throwbacks you got the new joints you got all of that right so um i decided to make my concert uh just with my three pieces a progression of that because there's always when they play the throwbacks there's always uh, somebody saying, what you know about this? And it's like, you play this every day when we're in the park. So mm-hmm. 
Um, the first uh, piece that I'm going to be playing is called Love's Theme, and it's uh, composed by Gary White. Um, and this is actually one of, and it wasn't even on, um, it's, it's by him and his Love Unlimited Orchestra. You can see a video of him conducting them. But it's completely instrumental by, uh, by Barry White. And it's actually one of the only completely instrumental and orchestral um, to reach number one um, on some chart. I, I wish I had it in front of me, but I will look it up because it's like of all the orchestral pieces, Barry White on the top of the charts. What are we doing? Why are we not playing this? And everybody gonna recognize it. So here we go. We're gonna love singing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And there go your excerpt right there. That first that <laughs> opening lick. Right. Go That's ahead. gonna be an excerpt lick. Go take go ahead, take Proco 5 off of that. Put that in. <laughs> right. Um, so I'm showing my progression um by like the whole cross-generational thing um is is my theme. So I took a piece, one of and I've played this on Classical Black before, um, a piece that is um sort of in the middle of generations by Luther Vandross. Um, but he took, it's called Superstar, but he took and covered Aretha, uh, Aretha Franklin's Until You Come Back to Me at the very beginning. And it's full orchestra on this piece. It's in my orchestra ro rotation right now. Um, and it's, you know, him playing, uh, paying homage to, you know, Aretha Franklin, who is obviously at, you know, she's an ancestor now, but um, just a giant in, in <coughs> for Black people um, and who worked with orchestras as well. Um, and I think it's also the Vandross is kind of in the middle of like the older generation, the newer generation, we know who he is. So this is Superstar and the beginning is the cover of it. It's really hard for me to play portions of songs, but I just, <laughs> I want to say one of my favorite, um, my favorite sounds to come out of orchestras um, mm -hmm. are these soul orchestras, the Motown orchestras, the Love Unlimited orchestras, like, they just, mm -hmm. they got it, like, that season, and they, they have it, so, mm -hmm. um, and my last piece, this is, you know, at the Our Generation part. Um, it's actually called Block Party. I played it on Classical Black a couple weeks ago. I got a message from him. I was like, oh my God, I need this piece. It's by a composer named Marcus Norris. Um, mm -hmm. If you don't know him, he's a contemporary composer that you must know. I think he's doing his, his PhD in, in composition at UCLA right now. But it's called Block Party. There's a, a, a narrative to it. It's basically like two people who they knew each other in high school. They kind of liked each other, but they never, you know, whatever, whatever. And that's also, you know, a Black Party, especially when you come home. Mm -hmm. been home like it's very much a, a unifying um experience so it's a lot funny That's my block party community <clears throat> concert. That was real cute. I like that. Okay, so I don't have really a theme. You know, Delaney B. You know, I don't really, I don't really have. Yep, you do be like that. I don't really have a theme, but my like, what I was thinking about when I was like, okay, what am I going to pick for this intermission? I was like, well, one thing about Black people is that first of all I think in general I'm not gonna get free game but in general like a big thing that orchestras are missing out on in general is it is 
reaching out to and connecting with the black community like that is a especially some of y'all being in real black cities and it, it, the tone deafness for musicians is really be it's interesting to me but one thing about black people is that they will support black people that like we are community people black people will support black people and my favorite example of this i've said this before when we were on triloquy is i'm vegan and i don't there's not one person that cares about me that doesn't clown me for being vegan there's not there's not one person that doesn't clown me for that especially coming from my family is jamaican it's meat 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 this is brown stew this is curry this is and they like so you out here eating grass after we've raised you on this you know and however if you look at if you go down to slutty vegan in atlanta the line wrapped around the block four hour wait it's mainly black people in that line and none of them are vegan they just heard about a black woman black owned business it's vegan don't care let's go try it that's like no one is tapping into that because you were too busy trying to please a donor base that never mind i forgot we can't add nothing out but um so i thought about that and i feel like it not only including including um black people in this but also showing them that they are a part of classical music in a way that they don't they don't realize like they like this is our history as well it's not just some um old white people who didn't bathe in europe back in the 1700s like it's really like we are part of this and that's kind of like where my point of departure for my music was i also thought about doing a pre-concert chat with Lizzo a lot of y'all got money for that y'all not using it because y'all too busy planning your Beethoven spectacular but a pre-concert talk with Lizzo would actually be a really good idea because Lizzo is a flutist flautist whatever you want to say okay so that will be a really interesting also or using people who are like beacons in the black community who who speak well to black people like Crystal from from the Reed who has an interest in music she does she she likes to learn and she also played the flute when she was younger and can and people will be excited to go see that and also um dustin ross from the friend zone and asante from the friend zone these are people that you could contact and you would know who these people were if you hire black people and listen to black people and make them do the pre-concert talks anyway Okay, so my first thing I'm gonna play, there, one thing about me, I'm gonna include Adolf, Adolphus Hellstork. Like I love, Adolphus, Adolphus Hellstork is my favorite composer and that's on period. And um, his three spirituals um, for orchestra is one of my favorite pieces that he wrote. Um, and this is the third movement, O Freedom. <laughs> Okay, so let me paint the scene for you, okay? Before the intermission, we're gonna play <clears throat> uh, Samuel Coleridge Taylor's Violin Concerto in G minor. Soloist, let me tell you, let me put you on soloist. Caitlin Edwards or Chelsea Sharp. That's the soloist, okay? So here we go. This is, a viol this is his second movement from that concerto, Samuel Coleridge Taylor. I just give you a hug on the opening, okay? I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, skip ahead to the violin entrance, but like, I just love when music feel like that, especially when it's written by black people. That's like you know what that hug feel like. It feel like after church when you're trying to leave. That's what it feel like. And that's why some of y'all should change language on these orchestral audition, on these orchestral audition excerpt lists, because y'all say standard, that is a problem. Because is his is his violin concerto standard? Y'all could talk about that. Okay, I know this is this might be like low key like Katie for real. This last one, but I think I think the reason why people might roll their eyes at this selection is because orchestras have abused it in an effort to be to show that they are inclusive but if I were doing a piece for if I was trying to engage black people and do a community outreach piece I feel like Florence Price's Symphony E minor 
is a perfect selection for a second half, not because it's easy to find, not because everybody's doing it, but because of the history that that piece has. Florence Price was the first black woman to be recognized as a symphonic composer, period. And the Chicago Symphony Orchestra premiered this piece in 1933. Black people, that is something that they will feel attached to. Be like, okay, period, Miss Mamas premiering pieces with the, with the group down there on Michigan Avenue, okay? That's what that is, okay? This is her third movement. One thing about Florence Price, she's gonna have a juba, okay? Here's her third movement. Okay, auntie, come on, TT flow, period. <laughs> okay, so we're moving on? Yes, we are moving on. Just so y'all know, Sesame Black is normally at, let's say at least an hour, like an hour and a half to an hour, 45 minutes long. We are sweating right now. <laughs> like, it's hard. Like, I don't, <laughs> we gotta, we're gonna spread through some of this stuff. Yeah, we just gonna have to breathe through. But you know what? That's fine. Classically Black Podcast won't come in control. So, like, um, Yes, so now um, we're gonna get into um, um, back into the the discussion about quality, um, and and unpack some of the reasons why or some of the things that that go into uh, why people even say that, um, and how we can get past it. Um, so there's a difference, first of all, in um, and going back to the canon, there's a difference between uh, championing a composer and playing it just for the sake of playing it. Mm -hmm. And that's a two-sided thing because on one hand, saying just for the sake um, is used as an excuse a lot of the time to not play. That mm -hmm. like, oh, we want to do it because we like it, not, not just for the sake. And if you think that's like people who were saying that, I experienced that in real time two mm -hmm. months ago. People think that it's a chore to play your POC think it's a chore to play these for the sake they for the sake of playing this these are real these are these are direct quotes people really think that mm -hmm. and and the reason why i say it's a two-sided uh, situation is because i mean i do play black composers for the sake of playing a black composer but the difference is you know i i value that that's my values as a musician period you know um and i'm not using it I'm not twisting that around to use it as an excuse not to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I play, you know, I'm a, I'm a bass player, just for clarity. So, you know, the solo rep is, ooh, chile. Um, it's just, it's just, you know. And so, when if I find something for for bass, it's a that's by a black composer. I don't care what it sounds like. I don't care what it sounds like because it's, it usually sounds great, and mm -hmm. nobody else is playing it. You know, and and so I will be the one to play it because it is a black composer and mm -hmm. because. I want that to be, I don't want to give a recital that's not going to, um, that's not going to add anything to people's musical experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same thing with me. I mean, like, it, it, it's hard when like, the institution requires certain things. But the first thing when when asked, what are we gonna play? What do you think we should do? I'm the first thing out of my mouth is going to be a black composer. Then I might and but what I realized with doing that sometimes like, I one of the last time I got asked is, I said a black composer first and then I said a white composer and we went with the white composer. So now I'm just gonna start being like, I don't know nothing else. I just know, I know I know Hale Stork wrote it. I know uh, Corbichello did this. So we could just pick with which one we wanna do. Because if you don't do that, if you, it, don't, it doesn't even matter how much I wanna play, you know, I've never played this. I've never, I've always wanted to play this. It doesn't matter how much, how much I wanted to sometimes like, in this moment, in this time, it's like, if you offer, I've noticed if you offer a white option, that it will be the white option. It will be the one like, oh, I know that, or I, yeah, let's. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to have time for questions. So I wanted to highlight our last point. Yeah, let's jump down. We've talked, we've talked a lot about, you know, the programming thing, but we also want to talk about hiring real, real, real. Because it comes up with both staff and it comes up with um, musicians. This again, this what about the quality? Um, and wondering, oh my, do they have the skills that are necessary to play on stage? Is it worth jeopardizing the quality of the ensemble um, <laughs> to, to hire a black person and maybe to the finals? They First of all, I'm sorry. and I feel like if we're gonna keep it a buck, 
I feel I find that maybe we could have that. Maybe if if it was people saying that like twenty years from now, I'd be like, okay. But we're not gonna act like half the people in the orchestra were just like they went to grab a drink with the conductor and they were just grandfathered in. And I know people be like, that doesn't happen. It happens. It does happen. Like we're not gonna act like everybody took a free and fair audition. So it's to say. Go ahead. I was about to say, especially in orchestras, <laughs> people are holding seats for like 45 years. Auditions free and fair? Yeah. And also don't, like people, the thing is, like when we talk about like, when we talk about like, we're in a time with classical music where everybody's good. Like you don't have to, we, we can talk about like what weight of a name an institution carries. Well, that's a separate conversation. But I'm talking about like how you really can go to state school and go to Eastman and get the same education because your teacher went to Eastman. Everybody's good everybody's good now you know what i'm saying like my teacher at isu like very good an outstanding violist everybody can't go to those schools because it's not even, it's not even about like oh who plays well and who doesn't play well how many spots do they got so it's like it's a it's just so it's very like it's really confusing that you've been holding up a spot for 45 years how were you playing when you got the job And last thing I'm saying on that um, is that it's just a misunderstanding of the black experience because to say that they do black people have the skills necessary to do the job, I don't know very many mediocre black people. Black I really people can't can name it. We can't afford to. We're not allowed to do that. I mean, looking at some of y'all, be like, wow, <laughs> you you did a whole presentation with no notes, just vibes. I wish I could do that. Like, and it's like, well, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, because you're not black. Everybody knows that. Mm -hmm. And and it's only this um, investigation. This this we're gonna open an investigation on the on the quality of mm -hmm. this um, when it's when we're talking about hiring uh, black people. Yeah, quality only comes up with blackness. And that's that on the Woo! Right. Um. <laughs> Let's take a couple questions. You want to go first? It's a, I, I didn't even, I had my notes for covering this up and I was like, y'all deep in here. Yeah, I was not um, expecting so many questions. At all. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's, you want to do the top three? Um, the first one says, do you have any thoughts on Philip Yule's work on decentering whiteness and music theory? How can we leverage that in our conservatories and beyond? That is a future episode of Classically Black Podcast. I would just, we'll just say that we are in the works with working one with one of our uh, people. Yeah, so one of one of the homies. So right. <laughs> um, this a, that we but we do have our finger on on the pulse of what uh, the recent updates on that situation and where you know anybody knows Classically Black knows we have a very very good friend who is a music theorist, um, HBCU grad and professor. Um, whose uh, research focus is in um, Black music, contemporary gospel, and neo soul music. So, um, a great person to talk to about this. Subscribe to Classical Black. Um, let's see. Um, I'm really enjoying this. Thank you. I just love how honest you are. Um, what do you think is going? To, what do you think um, it's going to take to get rid of the "what about the quality" question? I'm trying to choose my words gingerly because we can't cut nothing out. Um, I don't know. I feel like, I don't know. I don't know if I have a question for, I mean, my first, my first thought of that, y'all y'all gonna stop hiring white people? That was my first thing because it's like, I feel like those are the people who are asking those questions. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, I feel like they don't even be giving pe like black people a chance. Like you know what I'm saying? I don't. I don't even know how we will. I mean, we can of course change the narrative of how we. We can change the narrative of how we approach these uh, about we, how we approach these works. That might be a start. Like it's not just like all right, February. Let's whip out the Florence Price or just sprinkling it on top of an already incredibly white program. But those are, those are starts, but it's about taking out the toxicity 
and the toxic members of these institutions who when when you say when you say like we want to do something black in the in the back of they, the neck hair stand up like maybe it's time for them to step down you know what i'm saying so it's like it's it's i feel like it's not just a let's i, I also don't think it's like a, let's let's, pro, let's program a whole bunch of black stuff because these are the conversations that the music's going to be having backstage mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying it's it's i feel like it's really layered but i think that'll yeah. be start and it's also and it's also difficult because you're just talking to two people who are not afraid of confrontation um and who are not afraid <laughs> to to ask of oh, so why is it that you asked about what about the quality in this situation but not this one and mm-hmm. i would think we need to um to not shy away from those difficult conversations um and being asked honest questions and difficult questions is not a hostile work environment it's not the same thing yeah. so I think, um you know there needs to be um a willingness to challenge um like Katie said to challenge the people who are within your institutions and if they cannot be challenged and cannot you know be changed and cannot be receptive to that then I think they need to go yeah Okay, um, one-off commissions and collaborations do not rewrite the canon. That's just occasionally highlighting cherries on top of the white canon cake, right? Added and versus performative. Um, how can we impress on institutions that they have the power to swiftly rewrite the modern blueprint? That's a difficult question because yeah. I, I, I take issue with the fact that, that a lot of institutions feel like, how can we feel empowered to do this. And I'm like, why do you need, like, how do, like, why do I need to help you realize your potential? Your one hundred million dollar endowment to help you realize your your potential. Mm-hmm. The millions of dollars you have at your disposal and the access to uh, to celebrities and high profile people, people with large networks who can get the music of black people to large amounts of people who can bring in uh, audiences that would normally never go to the symphony or the opera. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like, I mean, maybe this session would do that because I'm just not in the business of, of saying, run, symphony run, like you can do this. <laughs> Like, what was that? No, I was just trying to think of the most empowering thing I could say. It's like I know what you mean. Like, how can we stress this? Um, and 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 you know, let them know that like you can you can do this. But it's just like, man, maybe because you know, classically black is like you said to a certain extent an echo chamber. Got my earrings falling off. Uh, <laughs> an echo chamber. I'm moving around too much. An echo chamber. Just gonna, just gonna do this like this. It's okay. An echo chamber. Um, lost my train of thought. It's okay. I mean, yeah, I I agree with. I agree. I've, I've said this on the show before about how we have to realize that some of these institutions simply do not want to change, and I feel like we have to. And I feel like they are a lot of these. I feel like we've been bamboozled because a lot of them want to make it look like they're changing. Right. That's what they that's I'm really irritated with you holding your ear like this. <laughs> like this. Carol. <laughs> the space out of me. Like, um, but I agree. You can't make you can't make and that's period. There you go. Just like that. Mm-hmm. Um, you can't make people change who don't want to change. And mm-hmm. I feel like if if you looking at your these these institutions, like speaking about schools, for example, they plan their program out almost like maybe six months in advance for schools. I'm not talking about orchestra, I can't speak to that, but I know for schools, they plan it out like six months in advance. And they really sit down with, like, I know they sit down and they look at the whole program and they're like, yep, good to go. And it's all white with like one black composer or one Latinx composer. And like, that's good. It's like, I don't, you can't, I can't, and you can't read and you can't take the temperature of the room. There is nothing for me to impress upon you. (laughs) Like. (laughs) you looked at that and you were like yep stellar chef's kiss wow amazing gang's all here <laughs> oh, the gang's all here <laughs> yep i didn't mozart and ooh, and a little debussy just to make it international Listen, you know how we do you know i mess with debussy I we do like we, when I'm I, I mean we like four four over here yeah. or anything <laughs> or anything <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, um, 
I want to, there's a question here, and it's probably our last one, sorry, y'all, but we'll, we'll say our contact information and stuff, but um, what are your thoughts on creating new orchestras and ensembles that will cater to the needs of the people? Lord knows we can't wait on orchestras to create the, the change that we want and need. Blockchain technologies can help make this a reality. I was talking to Lenny about this recently. And it's difficult because it's always a line to toe, right? Because on one hand, I mean, at, especially like as, like as, what am I even doing with my life right now? I, like, I'm a fellow with the Memphis Symphony. I actually really enjoy the symphony part. I, I enjoy my, I enjoy what I'm doing because I feel like, I feel like, you know, the works that have been programmed thus far, I feel, I don't feel it, like it's patronizing. I don't feel like it illicitly centers whiteness, I feel very comfortable in that. Um, however, knowing that like not all orchestras are like the MSO. And I tell it's hard to toe the line between, you know, black people need to be in those spaces and black people making their own thing. Cause I just feel like it's just so tired that black people have to continue to make their own things. White people, white institutions are are um are explicit in not letting us in or letting us in a little bit. White people go and make their own things. Black people go and make their own things. And then they're like, okay, maybe we can let, let's uh, let, lighten up a little bit. And if you think I'm just talking, we see this, like I'm a member of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated. The reason why Sigma Gamma Rho was started along with the other sororities and fraternities of the D9 is because we were not allowed to pledge white sororities. We can take a look at HBCUs. We were not allowed to study in white spaces. Black people always gotta make something. So it's like a it's it's a hard line to toe between like, yes, we should have our own stuff. But then it's like, but we should also be in these spaces because that's we deserve that. Yeah. All right, y'all. Well, that's our time. Follow us on social media at classically black podcast, classically black podcast.com. Um, isblackmusicians.com um, for the black content creators on the ground. Thank you for coming. I'm going to go find my earring back. <laughs> Goodbye, y'all. <laughs>